Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner, and it's great to have you all with us. As you are all too well aware, Real News has been covering the Gaza war with real intensity and real focus. And the work I've been doing here, and not in our name, to Max Alvarez's stunning interviews, especially the recent one with Issa Amaro in Gaza, the coverage of so many here at The Real News. And in this segment of The Mark Steiner Show, we'll look where this war is going in Gaza, not only where it might take Palestinians and Israelis, but the entire world. My guest is Chris Hedges, a journalist here at The Real News who you know lived and covered Gaza, was Midi's Bureau Chief for The New York Times, covered the wars in Iraq and the former Yugoslavia, and here at The Real News has the Chris Hedges Report. Well, Chris, thanks. I appreciate you taking the time. I know you've sure. got 10 different interviews and on your way out, <laughs> so it's good to have you here. Let me just start with one of the obvious questions people are asking. What is the end game here for Israel, do you think? What do you think we're, what do you think we're marching towards? Well, most of the people in the Netanyahu government, including Netanyahu himself, have been quite clear for often decades what the end game is, and that's the destruction of the state or even the idea of Palestine. And that will be accomplished through acts of genocide and ethnic cleansing. And I, I fully expect uh, things to get worse in Gaza. I mean, they're bombing the hospitals now. There's not enough food or water. Uh, there's Israel is impervious to requests from Washington because of the Israel lobby. Uh, they have traditionally Israel, because of the power of the Israel lobby, uh, does, it doesn't really matter what any administration wants. They humiliated Biden when he was vice president and called for a moratorium on settlements. And then the day he was in Jerusalem, announced an expansion of settlements. They uh, bypassed uh, the White House to go speak by Netanyahu, to go speak before Congress to denounce the Iran deal. Uh, they know that, in essence, the Biden administration can't touch the military aid and has no uh, ability to really pressure the government to halt this massive bombing campaign. And I, and I want to put that bombing campaign in perspective. I was in Sarajevo during the war. We were being hit with uh, three to 400 shells a day, uh, four to five dead a day, two dozen wounded a day. And I don't want to minimize that. I almost 30 years later still have nightmares mm -hmm. because of it. But that's nothing compared to what's happening in Gaza. I mean, the first two weeks, they damaged or destroyed 45% of the housing stock. Um, they've dropped, uh, I think it was just in the first two weeks, 20,000 tons of bombs. I mean, this is, you know, a Stalingrad level. Uh, it, it, it's as bad as Sarajevo was. It, it doesn't come close. Thousands of Palestinians are trapped under the rubble. Um, and they have surrounded the northern part. I mean, they, they will do it piecemeal. They learned that from the Americans in Fallujah. You don't uh, essentially attack on a wide front. You, you break up your urban areas into sectors that you then dominate. So um, they've cut off Gaza City from the south, which is Gaza's largest city, about 700,000 people. And they're about to go in. Well, they'll go in. I mean, they don't want to... The problem with urban warfare, which I've been in, is that all of your heavy machinery doesn't really give you much of an advantage. So I think that it's saturation bombing. Uh, I, I mean, they will, they will keep uh, the northern part of Gaza cordoned off, surrounded, but I expect them to kind of bomb their way to victory or what they are going to continue or call, call victory. victory right. um, they don't really want to start crawling through the rubble fighting Hamas fighters. Uh, the tunnels are an issue. Um, you know, we don't know how big, but they're big. Uh, but they need generators in order to pump down air into the tunnels. Right. Um, I think most of the hostages are probably in the tunnels. This is also a very cynical uh, decision on the part of the Netanyahu government. I don't think many of those hostages are going to come back. I think they know that and they don't care. Um, uh, so it, it, they will... They've cut off food, in essence. They've cut off water. I mean, the trucks that have come over through Rafa are, it's negligible. Um, you know, it's, it's a very cynical kind of public relations ploy, but it doesn't do anything to alleviate the tremendous suffering. So I, I, I expect that they will push 
what remains of the Gaza population over the border into the Sinai, into Egypt, and they will never come back. And there have been reports in the Egyptian press that the Americans have approached the Sisi government. The Egyptian economy is in a mess at over $160 billion in debt, uh, and they will offer financial incentives, and probably if that doesn't work, they'll use threats and uh, to do Israel's bidding. Uh, and, and in essence, Gaza... Uh, it, it, Gaza as we know it, and I spent seven years covering Gaza. My office was right in the center of Gaza City. It just won't exist. Hmm. So two questions here that popped in my head as you were speaking. I mean, I'm talking to some people yesterday about um, Uganda and Entebbe and the airport and rescuing the hostages that took place. Talk a bit about, since from your experience covering wars and what's happening right now uh, in Gaza, why couldn't Israel have done that? Why couldn't Israel simply have gone in, found out where the hostages are, and rescued as many as possible? What do you think? Was that possible or was that impossible? No, because the uh, first of all, the hostages are dispersed over a wide area, and second of all, they're underground. You knew they were on the plane in Antibia. They were right. in an enclosed right. space. This is completely different. So I'm thinking about the American end in this. And I know it's not going to happen. But it seems like the only way conceivably to stop Israel from doing what it's doing at this moment would be the threat of a cutoff of aid. I mean, you see inside the Jewish world in America and the United States, um, I see it all the time, is a growing body of Jews saying, no, not in our name, we don't agree. And, and whether it's marches or articles or, and organizations being developed. So, I mean, that seems to me to be the only way to stop the madness from well, that would be the only way. Even that might not work because Israel needs that aid to essentially replenish stockpiles. But, you know, they have a pretty robust arsenal. Well, those are the Jews that don't count. I mean, J Street and uh, uh, Jewish Voices for Peace. Not, no, don't count. I mean, for me, they count quite a bit. But I'm talking about in terms of the power structure. And it's, it's money. I mean, it's... Uh, APAC and, and these, you know, Sheldon Adelson type retrograde Jewish billionaires. By the way, they funded Netanyahu. I covered that campaign. Netanyahu right. was their baby. They they created him and they bankrolled him against Rabin. Um, so, yes, I mean, I think the ultimately that's why I support the boycott, divestment and sanction movement, that it is – about severing aid and imposing sanctions on Israel. That's the only weapon we have. We're very far from achieving that. Even most of the liberal groups don't support BDS. Um, and uh, it, 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 the, the Israel lobby is just so well-funded and so powerful. And they represent a political strain, of a very right-wing political strain within the American population that – it does not, uh, I would guess, represent the political leanings of probably most American Jews. When I see what's going on in Gaza and Israel right now, in Palestine, I mean, I know that Israel is, uh, is not attempting. They're going to seize a huge portion of Gaza. They're going to call it a buffer. They're going to do whatever. They, they may put settlers in. They may not. But they're going to they're going to seize a huge portion of Gaza, pushing Palestinians out. But this seems to me, having been through covered. Uh, this my entire life almost, either when, when I was a young Zionist to, to a place where I became a non against that. Um, but this seems really different. This moment seems really different in terms of what could happen post war and how it could affect. Well, it's not different, it's just different in scale. And the Nakba or the catastrophe 48. were right, 750,000 Palestinians ethnically cleansed from their was pushed into places like Gaza and refugee camps, the 50 massacres that the uh, Haganah or the Jewish militias carried out. So that, that's that been part of the Zionist project since the founding of the State of Israel. And in the uh, 67 war, they pushed out another 350,000 people. So uh, it's it's a difference in scale. It's not a difference in intent. I think the difference is that we have, uh, you know, this this government is the most extremist that Israel has ever had. Many of right. these people are heirs to Amerikahana, who I knew and covered. This uh, 
you know, rabidly racist, right-wing Brooklyn rabbi who founded the Cock Party, which was outlawed in 94 by uh, Israel and declared a terrorist group by Israel and the United States, which it was kind of – there's always been a strain of fascism within going back to Jabotinsky, the kind of pioneer of – Zionism, Benito Mussolini called them. The Herut party. Yeah, Herut, uh, they call them, I think, uh, Mussolini. And Netanyahu's father worked for Jabotinsky, called him a good fascist or something like that. So it's always been there, uh, but now it, it's predominant. And um, they, for them, it's the final solution or their version of the final solution, which is and, – and they won't stop. And once they finish with Gaza – they will turn on the West Bank and uh, they would – they want to create – these are their own words – a kind of religiously pure state which means the forced exile, ethnic cleansing, whatever you want to call it, of millions of Palestinians, including Christians. I mean there's a significant Christian population among the Palestinians. To, to, they, they think they're going to uh, finish with this problem once and for all. Clearly the opposite is going to happen. I mean this – I mean, if, if 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 Israel's game was to end Hamas, and end end that organization, this will do the exact opposite. This particular war is going to have more recruits, more people who are going to be up against the wall and have right, no but, choice. But they may all be pushed out of the country. I mean, look at the Armenian genocide. Uh, I mean, the 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 world has a short memory. I really, for me, what's happening now is very akin to the Armenian genocide. Everybody was very public. Everybody knew what the Turks were doing, but nobody did anything. And that's kind of where we are now. Uh, I mean, it's worse in the sense that the United States is actively backing and supporting the genocide in term, with intelligence, with military support, vetoing the calls for the ceasefire at the UN, et cetera. Um, I mean, what you, what you will – you will certainly create blowback probably in the form of terrorism. Um, but once these people are pushed out of their land, uh, then and and permanently thrust into the diaspora, which I think is the plan. Um, you think that's Israel's Israel's yeah. plan? Yeah, I, I mean the the people in around Netanyahu, they they've long been calling for this. Yeah, I mean th this is you live there for quite some time, Israel, even Gaza, covered it all. I'm curious what you think. What happened inside of Israel? For, it, it, there's, always been, there's always been a kind of uh, something twisted. I mean, from the time of 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 uh, of, of Buber and uh, Khal Ka'am kind of wanting, screaming for a binational state in 1948 to the forces in the 68 trying to create something different with Palestinians, uh, but something something fundamental has shifted inside of Israel, inside of the Israeli body politic. I know there are close to one million Israelis, might be most of them on the left, out of Israel now. They're in Germany, they're in Vietnam, they're here, they're across the globe. But something really has shifted here. And to me, it feels like an openly fascistic state is being yeah, created. Yeah, it is openly fascistic. The, I, the difference is it, there was a kind of – and I knew Teddy Kalak and Abi Iba and all these figures, uh, very urbane, charming, well-educated right. – um, it, there, there, it was kind of, you know, keep them uh, happy on the farm kind of, you know, we'll build sewer and I was there in the late 80s and early 90s. They were building new sewer systems in East Jerusalem, this kind of stuff. So it was a kind of uh, attempt to domesticate the Palestinians without employing this kind of savage violence that we see in Gaza and to a lesser extent, of course, the settlers are being – armed uh, and rampaging through the West Bank, through Palestinian towns, killing indiscriminately over 130 Palestinians. Civilians have been murdered since right. October 7th. So, but the goal was always the same. I mean, and Elon Poppy and great Israeli historian and others, I think, have pointed this out. The goal was always the uh, control of Palestinians. They were never going to give it back. And it was how do we control a, uh, an occupied population? And it just that, let's call it liberal Zionism, 
didn't work. I mean, the fascinating thing about Rabin, who I also knew, is that he recognized that the occupation was killing his country. He didn't really care too much about the Palestinians, but he realized that it was distorting Israel to such an extent, militarizing it, feeding its that undercurrent of racism, which is now rampant within Israeli society, that the structures that were the secret police, collaborators, all this kind of stuff that any occupying force needs was very corrosive to Israeli democracy. Rabin got that. And of course, he was assassinated by a Jewish extremist uh, when Netanyahu, and I covered Netanyahu's rallies, when Netanyahu was running against Rabin, uh, he was allowing his supporters to uh, burn an effigy of Rabin in a right. Nazi uniform. Uh, they would uh, They would chant death to Rabin. Uh, at one point, Netanyahu walked in front of a mock funeral for Rabin. And Leah, Rabin's widow, blamed, I think correctly, blamed Netanyahu and his supporters for the murder of her husband. And after that, you know, there was... There was, I hope, you know, there was some hope under Rabin. Rabin had a very close relationship with King Hussein, who I also knew very well. They were very close, actually. And um, the Netanyahu and the Netanyahu government is just a whole other animal. I mean, Netanyahu became prime minister in 96, mm-hmm. and it is pretty much, with a few interruptions, you know, dominated Israel. And, and Netanyahu is always... Uh, mentored extremist Avidor Lieberman and all these so they're all they were all Netanyahu protégés. So uh I I don't have a lot of hope. I mean I'll do everything I can. I'm about to go I ahead. can hear that. Yes. Well, I mean you, I mean it's not my job to sell hope. <laughs> uh, you know, that's not journalism by no, the way. No, it's not. It's my job to assess the situation as clearly as I can. So having covered it so intensely, having been in other war zones, I've been wrestling with what could come out of this. What could be, not, not Israel's end game. Israel's end game is to, is to push the Palestinians out, take over the land. Well, but the, what, what could actually... This, well, Israel will become a fascistic state ruled by the ultra-Orthodox, kind of Jewish version of Iran. Which we use as a digression, which we, growing up, as Zionists between Israel and Baltimore would mock as frummies, as people who were on the fringe, who were somewhere else. There were these, and, and not, not, not close to power, not completely well, shifting. That used to down. be true, but not yes. anymore. Right, right. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's what, the, Israel's already moved pretty far in that direction. Netanyahu's dismantling of the judiciary is, of course, a huge step in that. But people who... Uh, speak out against the Netanyahu assault against democracy or the slaughter in Gaza are attacked as traitors and silenced. And I mean, there's a there's been a huge campaign preceding October 7th against Israeli human rights workers at Beth Selim. And, right. uh, and that will just now accelerate. There'll be no room for dissent. I, I feel that and watch it coming. I mean, I... I spent part of the last 50 years being called many times by certain folks inside my community as a Judenrat, just saying no to the occupation and what's, and what's going on. I mean, that tendency is now in control. And, and then, but the Palestinians, every time I talk to Palestinian friends now about the family, what's going on, I have, I have, I have family who lived on Kisufim and Misufim, and they, some of them may be hostages. We don't know, I don't know. I have friends in Palestine whose kids have been killed, people have been killed in this. And it, it's, so it's sometimes, though I'm covering it, it gets really hard because it gets really deeply personal to watch this go on. And, and what's happening in the Palestinian world, I think people don't really grasp the intensity, the, the, the madness, the murder that's taking place among Palestinians now, except for I, when I heard the piece that, uh, um, that Max Alvarez, editor-in-chief here did, um, with Issa on, in Gaza, it was just, it was just, it was heart rendering. People just, I don't think people really get how deep this is. Well, Israel's cut off all the internet and cell phone service because when you carry out genocide, you, you block 
the ability of the victims to reach the outside world. That's standard. Talk about talk about that for a minute. Just explore for people listening to us why you call it genocide. What, what, when you, that's, a, that's a huge well, term to use. Sure, because it's about the wholesale destruction of people and all of the mechanisms by which you can destroy a people. The denial of food, the denial of water, the denial of safety, the ability to flee. I'm fleeing to the south, they're bombing the south. Uh, they're bombing the supposedly corridors that they set up to go to the south. Um, it's indiscriminate dropping uh, 2,000 pound bombs on Jabalia, on refugee camps. Uh, Jabalia, I've been in, spent a lot of time in Jabalia. So Gaza's uh, one of the most densely packed spots on the planet, but Jabalia is the most densely packed spot in Gaza. And I think they bombed it three times. Well, nobody knows the number of dead because they're under the rubble. Thousands are under the rubble. So that indiscriminate, they're bombing hospitals. I mean, they, you know, they say, well, they're terrorist command centers or Hamas command centers. They're, they're bombing hospitals. They've cut off the fuel. The babies in incubators are dying. I mean, that's genocide. We talked about what the end game would be. I, I, and I, you've covered this so long and so intensely. I may have lived it intensely on some levels, but you've covered it intensely. You've been in the middle of it. How do you see it playing out over the next few years? What do you see happening um, between the U.S. and Israel? It, it, it's also affecting the West. It's affecting here. It's, it's, it could affect this election coming up between— Well, the wild card is whether it ignites a regional conflagration. Right. So that would begin in Lebanon with Hezbollah, but it wouldn't begin unless Iran greenlighted it. I don't think that Iran or Hezbollah wants to ignite a regional conflagration. Um, uh, but that, that's the wild card. I mean, you know, things can just go wrong. The, I've covered enough war that once you open that Pandora's box and, and let all those evil spirits out, they control you. It doesn't control, you don't control it. So yeah, things could go wrong that way. Uh, the arms manufacturers are thrilled. Uh, you know, they've, they're making money in Ukraine. They're making money with Israel. Because remember, most of this money is going straight to Raytheon and mm -hmm. Northrop Grumman, and that's who's making the money. So uh, I don't – the Palestinians have always been friendless, powerless, and the Arab states are very duplicitous about their commitment, which is largely rhetorical. And, and they're quite happy to sell the Palestinians out. And, you know, there's a lot of animus towards, I mean, for instance, Egypt hates Hamas because Hamas was born out of the Muslim Brotherhood. And they, CC with U.S. and Israeli backing, uh, seized power to essentially prevent a Muslim Brotherhood government from running Egypt. So there's, the, the Palestinians really don't have many friends. Um, Iran, Qatar, Hezbollah, but Syria to a certain extent, but not, not, I, I, am I, if I had to make an educated guess, I think Israel's going to get away with it. Get away with it. Get away with this massive campaign of. Before we close, because we're about to close, talk, what do you mean by get away with it? What, what are they going to get away with, do you think? Pushing most of the Palestinians out of Gaza and, and turning most of Gaza into a moonscape which is they've already done with the North. They've already done. Yeah, so, and I, I know that's what they want to do. I mean, that, that is without question. The question is whether they can be stopped, but I don't see the forces that are going to stop them. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a danger for the entire planet that we're watching unfold at this moment inside of Israel, Palestine, and the Middle East. Well, it, you know, it's just so... I don't sleep. I mean, you know, it's it's just so the the horror of it and the I mean, how many children are dead? Three, four thousand kids. I yeah, mean, at least it's just you know everybody on a hooked up to a dialysis machine or in an ICU or in an incubator. They're all dying. I mean, everybody's going to die. It's they're they're running out of food. They don't have clean water, um, and the 
intensity of the bombing campaign is unlike anything we've seen in the 21st century. I really don't know how far back you'd have to go. Maybe maybe Grozny. I mean, I'm friends I didn't cover Grozny, but friends of mine did. They said it was who had covered Sarajevo and they said Grozny was much much worse. I think people don't understand the the depth of this of, of the of the attacks taking place. Yeah, in Gaza. I would say. Mainstream media is not really giving the people here. Well, they're the not in Gaza, so it's you know, you have a few stringer Palestinian stringers and then You've seen Israel target the like Al Jazeera correspondent and others. So just as they did with the Shireen Abu Akhla, who was assassinated on the West Bank by an Israeli sniper. So uh, yeah, I think people don't get the intensity of it. And well, that's yeah. why I'm glad for your reporting. You've always done this. I mean, your whole career. I followed you when you were in the New York Times before we mm-hmm. ever met uh-huh. years back, and all the work. And and you bring that to light. They could use that again bringing that to light. Yeah. I'm, I'm serious. They could use that again. I'm glad you're here to, at Real News to do that. And Chris, I know you have a very tight schedule today. Chris, I just thanks so much for taking yeah, this time. I, and and I look forward to talking again. Yeah, and thank you all for joining us today. And I want to especially thank Chris Hedges for joining us here in studio in between his interviews and on his way to the airport. So please keep following this work here on The Real News, The Chris Hedges Report. And special thanks to Cameron Grandino and Adam Coley for getting the show on the air. Dave Hebden for editing the tireless Kayla Rivara, making it all work behind the scenes, and everyone here at The Real News for making this show possible. Please let me know what you thought, what you heard today, what you'd like us to cover, your ideas. Just write to me at mss at therealnews.com, and I will get right back to you. And we'll be continuing our coverage of what's happening in Palestine and Israel, so stay tuned for all that coming up. So for the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Stay involved, keep listening, and take care. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.